So thank you, uh, thank you to all of you for being here. Um, it's really great to present this book uh, here. If you read the acknowledgments, I owe so much to this seminar um, and to a lot of the people in this room for um, asking questions of my work and, and bringing this book um, to uh, fruition. Um, if I could have my presentation. Hopefully it will come soon. Um, so I have, um, I'm just going to run through the arguments in this book um, very quickly, actually. Um, and uh, if you have questions, um, please ask them in the Q&A session. Um, so I have two main arguments coming from two sets of questions that I had about theater in the Soviet Union. Um, as many of you know, I myself had an acting career. Um, I trained in drama school, and I worked for a few years. And none of the books that I read about Soviet theater um, spoke to my own experience backstage. Um, we can critique trying to impose your own experience on another culture. Um, but still, I felt that something was um, missing in the way that the world of, of real actors um, was presented and analyzed in scholarly literature. Um, and that was the book I wanted to write. Um, and I was particularly interested in um, two big questions. So. We can start with the book's title, Beaumont on Empire's Edge, State and Stage in Soviet Ukraine. And so the first question, um, what was the relationship between artists and the state? And why was it so specific? Why were artists so important? And why did the state care so much? Um, so I'm using this concept of um, Beaumont um, to break the binary of state and stage. Um, so there's this myth that I'm sure many of you know that Payet v Rasi bolshe chem Payet, right? A poet in Russia is more than a poet. Um, and it leads us to this idea of a, of a binary of the artist fighting the state. And so there's a lot of really wonderful scholarship, actually, working through how or to what extent such and such an artist, Meyerhold, Shostakovich, um, Kurbas, um, was in collusion with, or fighting against, or suppressed by, or um, working with the state. And um, I think rather than figuring out to what degree this collaboration or this dissent might or might not be true, um, my interest was actually in the nature of this relationship on a larger macro level, um, on a structural level, um, how it evolved and its consequences. Because the level of engagement on the part of the Soviet state towards its artists was something that had to be explained. And this relationship obviously um, came from the imperial period when um, the state made culture by decree. Um, and uh, obviously the people building this cultural infrastructure in the Soviet Union were people who'd grown up in the Russian Empire, right? So this was their um, lived experience. And it was very hard to be an artist in the Russian Empire, um, particularly hard to work in theater. Um, you could be stranded by an entrepreneur and left destitute in a remote village east of the Urals um, with no recourse. So the goal for early Soviet artists was to draw the state in, to make the state accountable for the purposes of financial support, guaranteeing audiences and enacting artistic agendas, right? And early Soviet artists were very successful at making the state accountable to its artists, um, and no one foresaw the consequences, right, that then artists um, would be accountable to the state. Also in the Russian Empire, artists did not belong to high society. If you, um, if you performed on stage, you actually couldn't have chin, you couldn't have rank. Um, and so again, early Soviet artists, by drawing the state into the arts and joining state institutions or party institutions themselves, managed to raise the social position of the artist, who became some of the most privileged members of Soviet society. And so um, on the one hand, um, this um, embrace between artists and officialdom led to extraordinary artistic output in the Soviet period. There's a lot of really extraordinary Soviet art. And in that sense, artists got what they wanted. They were very much a part of the state and able to get resources from the state for the arts. Um, but of course, the state also demanded fulfilling the plan, right? So then we have a question of can creativity happen on schedule, paplanu. Um, and I think this creative toll ultimately taken on artists um, has led to this myth of the noble Soviet artist, right? Um, and, and like all cliches, this myth is based in truth, right? Um, archival documents clearly demonstrate Officials forced artists to denounce their fellows, um, sent artists to the gulag, and shot artists in basements or forests. But the relationship between artists and the state was indeed, as archival documents also show, multidimensional. The state spent an enormous amount of time and money and paper um, and energy on artists. And this relationship between the arts and the state was one of the peculiarities of the Soviet Union. 
And so one of the arguments is the space between the world of people working in the arts and the world of people working in the state um, dissolved in the early Soviet years. And so this world of artists and officials is the Beaumont of the book's title. Um, and it's a concept that might be jarring. Um, it does sort of conjure up people sipping wine in Montmartre and talking about the arts. Um, but that's the point. Actually, there should be dissonance. Um, because those conversations about the arts are happening in the Soviet Union, but they're not happening in Montmartre, in a cafe. They're happening in state-owned apartments, they're happening in editorial offices, and they're actually happening in the Politburo. Um, so this sort of peculiar over-engagement with the arts on the part of the state was one focus of the book. And the second is this Empire's Edge Soviet Ukraine piece. Um, so in other regional fields of study, it has long ago been accepted that culture is constructed. No one would argue that there is a primordial French culture. Rather, we hear from Eugene Weber that peasants became Frenchmen, right? Or Linda Colley talks about how at a very particular moment, because of particular structural circumstances, people on this island started to conceive of themselves as British, right? Um, uh, so the very notion of a national culture has not been considered an objective um, category, but rather an analytic problem. And I really wanted to um, build on that. There's some work on this um, in the Soviet field. Um, Adib Khalid, um, his work on Jadid culture, and um, his recent book on making Uzbek, uh, Uzbekistan and making Uzbek culture, um, and Serhii Kelgic's um, work showing the Soviet roots of, of national tropes and that there's nothing more Soviet than a folk festival. Um, so my book does not assume Ukrainian culture as an objective category, but rather argues that Soviet Ukrainian culture was constructed as a result of a struggle between competing groups in Soviet Ukraine and between Soviet Ukraine and Moscow. Um, and I think this focus on cultural construction suggests a slightly different interpretation of Soviet nationality policy. Um, so generally, we focused on um, this chronology. So first comes chronization, indigenization, promoting the arts and culture of the titular nationality of the republic, um, which is great. Um, Non-Russian culture flourishes, which provokes its impression by an increasingly Russifying Stalinist state. And of course, there's much that's true um, in this interpretation. But I think it includes two really, really important factors. And one of those is internal dissent on what exactly Soviet Ukrainian culture is. Um, and the other is this large story of the centralizing rise of Moscow, which I'll, I'll touch on shortly. So the people at the heart of my book, um, and here they are, um, were the men of Kyrenizatsia, creating and writing the wave of cultural explosion in Ukrainian. But I think their story highlights actually the challenges of Kyrenizatsia, which is that it assumed ethnic categories, and actually that's what people were trying to figure out. It was not clear what, con what constituted Ukrainian culture, let alone Soviet Ukrainian culture, and how that might be different from Russian or Soviet Russian or Soviet Polish or Polish or Yiddish or Soviet Yiddish culture. Um, who got to decide what Soviet Ukrainian culture would be? Playwrights, the Politburo, the audience? Um, so this was a real challenge um, for all the guys in my book. Um, and secondly, there's this piece of the dynamic with the center and the centralizing rise of Moscow. And I think that looking at culture as constructed allows for a larger view of cultural topography, um, by which I mean the relative importance ascribed by officials and audiences and audiences to various regions, right? Um, so how did Moscow become a center? because it was not a theatrical center in the Russian Empire. It's a big city, but it wasn't a center, and it becomes the center. So how did that happen? Um, and if there were different regions in the Soviet Union, then surely the relationship between them is as important as the relationship between the Soviet Union and the West, right? There's a lot of really great work now on transnationalism, right? Soviet Union and the West. Um, but what about the relationship, as I call it, the internal transnationalism of the relationship of the regions inside the Soviet Union um, with each other? OK, so how do I do this? Um, through narrative. Um, I wanted to write a book that people wanted to read, um, which can be rare with history books. Um, but uh, I wanted to write um, a, a readable book. I'm, I'm not sure to what degree I succeeded. Um, and uh, so I decided to do a kind of collective biography. Um, so I took um, my Soviet Ukrainians, um, Mikola Kulish um, with the mustache, um, Ostap Vishnya, looking dreamy, um, Les Kurbas um, at, the, at the top left, um, and I paired them 
So I took the Soviet Ukrainians and I paired them with artists who are actually generally from this region but moved north to Moscow. And if you stopped someone on the street, they would more likely know Mikhail Bulgakov um, than Mikola Kulish, if they know any of them, right? Um, and this, this pairing, um, I think, does two things. On the one hand, it oddly provincializes Moscow in that um, it sort of makes the story of Soviet culture a Moscow story. And, um, and in fact, when you look at this larger pantheon of Soviet artists, you realize there's something structural going on, right? Um, that there's actually a structural relationship between the artists and the state. Um, by expanding the, the number of artists we put in this sort of pantheon of great Soviet artists. But it also Sovietizes um, these Ukrainian artists. And I think one of the major arguments of the book is that they're Soviet artists. Um, they were um, not opposed to the Soviet project. They were a part of it. They um, actually made this Soviet cultural infrastructure. Um, and, and I think that's very important. So um, the structural use of the pairs is something that I, I hope works in the book. Um, so I have a chapter on these two writers, uh, Mikhail Bulgakov and uh, Mikola Kulish. Um, and in this chapter, I talk about how this sort of early Soviet Beaumont emerges as artists work in state institutions. And I talk about this story of um, Mikhail Bulgakov's play, Days of the Turbans, Stalin's favorite, by the way. He saw it 15 times. Um, and Mikola Kulish was so incensed by it, he wrote um, a polemic response um, called Patetichna Sonata, Sonata Patetik, um, which was not produced in Soviet Ukraine. They would not uh, stage it, but it got produced in Moscow and actually had a pretty decent run until Kaganovich shut it down because of stuff that was happening in Soviet Ukraine. So is this a, a Soviet Ukrainian story? Not really, because it was produced in Moscow. Is it a Moscow story? Not really. It's actually this in story of, I think, internal transnationalism um, and greater Soviet um, culture. So then I have a chapter on Ostav Vishnya on the left and the famous uh, Soviet writing duo of Ilf Petrov um, on the right. And I talk here about the challenge of Soviet entertainment, which is very hard for artists who are engaged in art with a capital A. Um, and I use this production at uh, Kurbas' theater, the Berezil, um, Aluna um, which was the first Ukrainian language variety show. Um, and this, I talk in this chapter about the difficulty of making um, local culture in the Soviet context, which interestingly is an argument I worked out here at the Danilo seminar about five years ago, and it ended up with different people in a different chapter, um, but um, in the book. And this, this sort of challenge, actually, of making um, popular culture that is not ethno-folk um, and, and that also is not this sort of historical melodrama, I think, continues to be a challenge. And we see that sort of reflected in the paper we heard earlier today. Um, and interestingly, this chapter ends with an uh, uh, unproduced screenplay that Petrov wrote. Um, when Ilfe died, he, he, wrote a, he continued writing. And he wrote a screenplay about dueling folk orchestras from Soviet Ukraine. Um, and of course, their everyday experience and their life and loves as they, as they duel with their um, banduras. Um, and interestingly, in 1940, when he wrote that screenplay, the challenge the Soviet Union was facing, and particularly Soviet Ukraine, was they had no jazz and no popular music when they moved into eastern Poland, right? what's today western Ukraine. And they move into the city of what's today Lviv, um, and they have no um, entertainment. So they have to outsource to Polish Jewish refugees um, to make uh, entertainment um, for their audiences. So the next chapter, for audience, yes. Um, Side note, this is my, one of my favorite photos um, taken by actors in Kurbas' theater right before they were going to start to perform. This is in 1923, and you look at their um, audience, and um, I like to think of this as the great challenge for Soviet artists is the audience. Um, so my next chapter is on um, Les Kurbas on the right and Solomon Mikhoyls um, on the left. And in this chapter, I talk about this category of the official artist and how we see this category emerging um, in the late 20s and early 1930s um, through these two figures who are both non-Russian language minority artists, um, but who achieved different levels of success because of where they were located in space in the Soviet Union. Um, Mikhoyls was in Moscow and sort of rode the wave of high culture to the Kremlin, and Kurbas, um, um, a great artist, but only in Soviet Ukraine, so he could only rise um, so high. and. Um, I do this analysis through um, uh, Kurbas' production of Ivan Mekatenko's play, Diktatura, Dictatorship, a play about collectivization, um, a really typical kind of hack 
play about getting grain from the village, um, but which Curba spun um, and made it a completely different um, work. You can see here it's a completely non-realistic um, stage set. He actually made it a musical um, in, in large ways um, and added a film component. Um, so he changed the form so much that uh, many people accused him of changing um, the content. Um, and uh, my next to last chapter is on the, the role of the arts official. Um, and I prefer to use the category of arts official rather than patron. Um, the central figure in this chapter is Andrei Khvilia, who wanted to be a writer but became a manager of artists instead. Um, and his actual job was not being a patron but actually managing the arts, right? That's what he did every day. His job was managing these artists. Um, and I discuss in this chapter the theater of um, collectivization in particular, Makola Kulisha's play, Maclena Grasa, um, which was produced in 1933 um, at Las Curbas' Berezil Theater, um, ostensibly about famine in Poland, but really obviously um, about what we now call the Holodomor. Um, and what's interesting is that there's a, a memoir account of um, this play being performed kind of as a dress rehearsal for officials to see if it could be sanctioned for production and obviously incredibly um, terrifying for the artists. Um, and then the play was shut down. Um, and the reality from archival documents is actually much more complex and interesting. Actually, there's some very interesting conversations between Khvilia, the arts official, Kurbas, the director, Kulish, the playwright, where you see these two really different visions of theater. So for Kulish, in a way, he's a very traditional playwright. We're having a famine. We should have theater about famine. We should be talking about it. Theater is an agora, a space for discussion. And Hvilia says, um, you can't do this. You can't show this. It's depressing, and it will affect the audience. They will be upset, right? So it's this sort of positioning of the state as protecting the audience um, from the artist, um, which I think is very um, important. And so the final uh, chapter sets out the new Soviet theatrical network, which included um, two locations, the Gulag and the Kremlin. Um, so this chapter follows Kurbas and Kulish in one camp, um, Vishnya and another actor, Hirnyak, in another. Um, and I think that the Soviet state murdered Kurbas and Kulish in November 1937, obviously is a tragedy and one with great consequences um, for the development of theater in the Republic. But it's a tragedy not restricted to Ukrainians, but actually typical of the entire Soviet period. And at the opposite end of the Soviet theatrical network, we have the Kremlin, where Stalin created an entirely new um, court culture and a Soviet beau monde. But interestingly, the Soviet Ukrainians are not really a part of this story. Oksandr Kornichuk was there in April 1941, um, but that's about it. But my book does not end in the Kremlin. It ends in the afterlife of these legendary figures. Their art has created a legacy. Um, we don't have to refrain from speaking about them or studying them or their work. But I think the world in which they lived and worked has faded. And my book ultimately hopes to restore their context so we can appreciate what it actually was that they did and how it has shaped the world today. Thank you. <laughs>